Thanks so much for joining us today. I am Mona Ati. I'm the director of the Institute for Middle East Studies here at the George Washington. Um, really delighted Jillian Schwidler with us to discuss um, protesting Jordan, geographies of power uh, and dissent, which is published by Stanford University. Um, Dr. Schwedler is professor of political at the City University of New York's Hunter College and the Graduate Center. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Crown Center at Brandeis University. And this semester, she's distinguished CUNY scholar at the Advanced Research Collaborative at the Grad Center. Her work broadly engages with questions of contentious politics, political geography, Islamist politics, policing, neoliberalism, and political dissent. She's a member of the editorial committee for the Middle East Law and Governance, um, or Middle East Law and Governance. And for many years, she was a member of the board of directors and on the EDCOM uh, committee for merit. She has published several books, including Protesting Jordan, the award-winning Faith and Moderation, Islamist Parties in Jordan and Yemen. And um, she was editor with Wale Khalili of Policing and Prisons in the Middle East. Her articles have also appeared in numerous journals, including World Politics, Comparative Politics, and Social Movement Studies. Um, Dr. Schwidler has conducted research in Jordan, Yemen, and Egypt, and traveled extensively throughout the region with support from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Fulbright Scholars Program, the American Institute for Yemen Studies, and the Social Science Research Council. She will be in conversation today with Dr. Jeremy Crampton, who is Professor of Urban Data Analysis in the School of Architecture, Plan Architecture, Planning, and Landscape at Newcastle University. He's also adjunct professor at the Department of Geography this year. Um, Crampton here at GW. Uh, Dr. Crampton focus focuses on societal and political interactions between geolocation technologies and our everyday experiences. He's also written widely on critical geographies of surveillance, spatial big data, and al algorithmic decision making and the ways that these things are governed. He's been active in establishing the field of critical cartography since the 1990s and wrote a key monog monograph on this topic in 2010. More recently, he's been exploring geolocation implications of platforms, machine learning, and Web 3.0 for a project on the possibilities and barriers to developing counter geo AI. He's also writing a book entitled The Map and the Spyglass, The New Geographical Analytics of Everyday Life. Um, he's a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute and the Royal Geographic Institute in the United Kingdom and a member of the American Association of Geographers where, he, where he's currently um, in residence. Um, so thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Uh, the format of the event is that um, Dr. Schwindler will introduce the, the book and give us a brief overview and then um, Dr. Crampton will be in, in conversation uh, with Dr. Schwedler about the book. So, and then we'll open up at the end for questions from the audience. So, um, Julian, I'll let you take it. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thanks for having me here. And thank you for joining as a discussion. I'm really excited about our conversation. Um, so I want to just give an outline of the book. It really covers a lot of ground, but just to give some general themes, it's a book on protest in Jordan from the 19th century to the present. Uh, Jordan's an authoritarian country that has a shocking number of protests in it. Uh, even Jordanians I'll often talk to and they'll say, oh, it's going to be a short book because they don't realize how many protests there are. And uh, a lot of them just aren't particularly disruptive. Um, and so I really am looking at a lot of the protests that are happening from the Ottoman period when uh, my definition of protest is really just uh, claims making in public space. So people gathering in public space to make some claim against some authority. So this allows me to include some of the early riots and rebellions, blocking roads, destroying public infrastructure, railway ties, et cetera, up through what we conventionally understand as protests as, you know, sit-ins and marches and, you know, uh, general demonstrations. And in drawing that long history, I find some really inter interesting patterns that weave into the present. The three main theoretical um, contributions I make, which weave through the different chapters are, the first is to look at protests as integral to state-making processes. So the example from Jordan is often told of as a state that was created, an invented state, although by the way, all states are invented states, but it's an invented state that was created with the British and the Hashemites after World War I 
who take this area where no state existed and create a centralized territorial nation state. Um, while they were doing so, there were some acts of rebellion and resistance that were basically violently put down, and that's the sort of end of discussion. What I'm trying to show is that those two aren't disconnected. The way in which the Jordanian state emerges, who becomes allies of the regime, who ends up getting employment, is part and parcel of who's protesting and how they're resisting. So one prominent example is the Adwan Rebellion, which is in 1923, which is violently put down by the British Air Force. Um, the head of the Adwani Tribal Confederation within months becomes a very close ally of the Emir. And in fact, that tribal confederation ends up with a disproportionate number of jobs, their prominent positions in the military over the next decades. So while that was a failed rebellion in the sense it was violently put down, it bore fruit. And so I show in a number of cases, in a large number of cases, the way the state emerges is in part because there is resistance and rebellion. So I'm trying to get away from the framework that looks at protests and what they're immediately trying to accomplish and whether they succeed or fail, right? So in the uprisings period, we say like, oh, all of the uprisings failed except in Tunisia, which might be failing now. And I think that's just a very limiting framework. So I'm trying to sort of take a, a longer term view, which allows us to see patterns, allows us to see when Jordan does have an uprising period, um, what are innovations and what are just uh, new versions of old repertoires of protest? So that's one piece of it, tra uh, tracking protest as ongoing, not as these exceptional periodic events, but sort of resistance is ongoing and integral to state making. As I said, this alone isn't a, a original intervention. It exists in the anthropology of the state literature. It exists in feminist geography in a number of places, um, but it doesn't get brought forward in this telling of Jordan and in a number of other cases in the region. Uh, so that's one intervention. I'm just trying to sort of bring that forward. Another one has to do with the interaction of protest and the built environment or sort of protest and, and space. And here I'm looking at ways in which um, protests have effects on the ways the government either builds new streets or alters streets or roads, et cetera, and how different kinds of spaces affect protest whether certain places are more visible, certain places are more disruptive, more easily policed than other locations, et cetera. So I have a long discussion, which I'm sure we'll talk about some of that um, that comes through. And then the last main piece has to do with um, basically bringing international relations back into the sort of comparative study of protest. And that uh, what happens in Jordan, Jordan's not a hermetically sealed unit where what happens outside is irrelevant. And so I'm really interested in the ways in which Jordan's interconnections uh, regionally, globally, around securitization, finance, uh, neoliberal policies, exchanges, migration flows, what have you, end up being shaped by resistance in Jordan and elsewhere, and also in turn shape resistance. And so I give a, a large number of examples. If I was giving a full book talk, I would go through a series of slides to make it all tangible and empirical so you could see it all. But I'll stop there because I was asked to try to keep it to five minutes or so, and I'm sure some of them will come up in conversation. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me as well. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to have uh, read your your very illuminating book. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, perhaps first of all, about your experience um, researching researching the book. You, you begin right on the first page, even in the acknowledgments of saying that um, you thought you were good at field work, uh, but when you talked to Jordanians, um, they said that your work is focused on elections and political parties and the state as a whole. And you use this quote from one of them, mm -hmm. I just don't recognize Jordan. So I, I wanted to to get to what you try to do in this book, you call it a, an ethnography of place uh, in one of your in one of your chapters. And certainly after reading it, you get a, a real sense of the ebbs and flows of protest, uh, how they work. You talk at one point about a, a car pulling up into the parking lot of a mosque. Um, the, you talk about the look on the faces of protesters or the security forces. Um, even the flags that are that are unfurled. 
So I was just wanting to, to begin with what it was like for you um, to perform this, this research. Uh, and how do you get all this access to, to people uh, involved in the protests? Great. Um, yeah, I actually start most of my talks with that very um, comment. Um, by, yeah, so I, he, a, a interlocutor had asked me to bring some articles on stuff in Jordan, and I brought a pile of stuff, and then when I asked him about it, he said, I don't recognize Jordan. Uh, and, you know, you guys are writing about, my book was about political parties, and people writing about elections and parliament. And he's like, that's all a sideshow, you know, that's about patronage and stuff, but that's not really what we understand politics to be about. So it was a fairly devastating comment, but I tried to take it seriously and ask more about what I should be seeing and to look differently. And that's that's why there's so much detail in some of those um, things. Um, so I was already interested in writing about protests for my next project because um, there's so many protests in Jordan. Uh, most of them are small. There's a lot of labor strikes. There, I mean, there's just, there's so much. There's hundreds of years since 1989. And in the years during and after the uprisings, thousands a year. It was so much cr uh, creating a database, a data set that I had to abandon it because it was so much, I was just discovering so much. It was crazy. Um, so in political science, I'm a political scientist. I'm a uh, unorthodox political scientist, as you can see, because I'm a, a tourist in the field of geography. But um, Protests tend to get looked at within two frameworks. Either the events data analysis we're accumulating, which is what I was doing in part, accumulating this data set, and then you can look for patterns in those data. And the second is as part of social movement studies, right? And so in social movement theory, you're looking at a particular movement, like the labor movement, or Islamist, or women's rights, what have you, and you're concerned with the arc of the development of that movement. And in those studies, there's protests, but protests are something the movement does. And then the movement's really the object of analysis. And so I started, as I started to take this, you know, looking uh, more at protests and accumulating this data, I started to see other patterns that didn't fit into that framework. For example, and I have a, a, a extended discussion of one protest location, of several protest locations, um, but what happens at that protest location over a series of protests that are about completely different topics. So if you're just looking at labor, you're gonna notice the labor movement is it on the fourth circle at the prime ministry in certain instances, but there's all kinds of other protests there. And if you stop looking at movements and just look at protests in one space over time, you see different kinds of things evolving. So it was just intended to not say that literature is wrong or bad or not helpful, but that it's not seeing certain things. Um, and so that was, I really was trying to bring that forward. Um, do you want me to mention how I got into space or is that a separate question you have? I'm sure, no, yeah. we, can, we can touch on that certainly. So, cause it came from another, a different interlocutor of mine where I had done this analysis of the public gathering law from 1952 and all the amendments over it and changes in all kinds of crazy ways. And that's not in the book, is it? Because uh, I lost my manuscript at one point and I decided to not reconstruct that whole passage because it wasn't as relevant. And after I had done this and I was working, I was talking to activists about all this work I had done and all the changes. And he said, yeah, Jillian, nobody cares about the public gathering law. Like the Muslim Brotherhood cares about the public gathering law because they don't want to do anything out of line. So they'll always get permission. They're like, we just do what we want. I was like, oh, so what am I missing? And he's like, the spaces we're looking at are disappearing. And I'm like, what does it mean for protest space to disappear? And so I started reading into some, you know, political geography, Don Mitchell, who works on protest and space specifically, um, and some others subsequently, and in conversation with them, started thinking through these issues and started reading and as a tourist in architecture and urban planning. And once I started thinking about space, it just revolutionized the whole way I was seeing things. And so part of what I bring forward um, uh, in the book and uh, a number of Jordanians have read it and have commented very positively, even if they don't agree with all the analysis, but they're like, no, you're right. This, these are things happening. And you can see, see the protests in different kinds of ways by bringing that detail. So I just, it was that detour that took me into a completely different framing of the project. Cause you can't unsee when you, I mean, you're a geographer, once you start seeing things about space, you can't unsee, you see it everywhere. And it just really changed the way we were looking at it. And that made me look at the political science 
protest literature is even more uninteresting than I thought it initially was, because it was just missing all these variations. The large data analyses would see thousands of people in the downtown area as more contentious than, you know, two dozen people in a little village outside of the town. And yet that's not the case. Thousands of people downtown are not necessarily contentious. And so it's explaining why. So that's sort of, that's where that sort of came from. And then I spent the next decade doing it. I had a lot of access. I've been researching, my first article on protests was in 1996. So I've been attending protests. There's a chapter on routine protests, which mm -hmm. I didn't discover were routine until I went to a whole bunch of them and realized that they're the same thing over and over and over. Um, and so it's just from over the years, uh, attending as much as I can, talking to protesters, watching their th thinking evolve, watching people get arrested and harassed and have their lives destroyed for activism. So it's really, it was a long, a long project. Yeah. And that chapter on routine, routinization of protests is particularly fascinating one. I hope we get time to come back to that. Um, I think you say in the book that you were last there in early 2020, is that right? And yeah, I was there this summer. I, I was but going to ask if you right, been but, back since. Yes, but yeah. in the book, that was the last trip was right before the lockdown. Okay. Okay, but you have been back. Since. Yeah, I was back this summer in okay. July. Um, you begin the book, though, um, with the, the story of Amman, um, growing from where you characterize it, a, a very small town in the 1910s or so, uh, to one now of about is it five million? Yeah, four or five billion. Four or five million. Um, and you, you, you very evocatively describe the the steep hills um, in those early days, uh, from which people could watch the protests, um, but also the act, the the very nature of the fact that there were these steep hills concentrating protests in the downtown area of of Amman. Um, but by the 1980s. Amman had uh, developed and sprawled out, um, and now you know, you, and you talk about a wealthy West Amman, um, and um, as you mentioned in your introduction, these projects of ma really massive infrastructural uh, development. So I kind of wanted to um, get a better understanding of how you see the relationship, as it were, between infrastructure uh, as a form of politics or do you see it that way are you talking about the particular spaces or just the general sprawling of a man i mean there's kind of two pieces to that yeah okay okay so the first is um i trace how when protests first start in amman in they start in the 20s and uh amman was there were no protests there prior to it because there was no seat of power there were just some Circassians and Chechens and some various um, merchants. And uh, once it becomes the capital, um, and it partly becomes the capital because the desire to settle in Salt as the capital gets met with demonstrations and they like, we don't want you here. So they settle in a place where there's no established local power. It's Bani Sakhar land, but it's not where Bani Sakhar resides seasonally. So the Bani Sakhar were kind of smart to go, hey, come live on our domain and you can have this town. Um, but that meant they didn't meet any local resistance. So that decision ends up, I argue, inverting the sort of political and later economic geography of the country, where you had these north-south towns that were the trade corridor, are suddenly outside of what becomes the booming capital. And a lot of the protests you see today is resentment at what's happening in the capital and them feeling they're left behind and their houses are collapsing and they have no water. But so as the city sprawls, so in the early days, you could shut down the city with, you know, a few hundred people or a thousand people because all the government offices were down there, you know, banks, trade, commerce, everything was down there. Um, and you could hear and watch it from if you were in a, uh, up on the hill, you could look down. As the city has sprawled and the, uh, the economic centers and government buildings are out of the downtown area, except for one, the municipal complex, they've all sprawled and dispersed. Um, Having protests down there still, it's still a known place for protests, uh, it's not disruptive anymore. And so the government is perfectly happy with thousands of people downtown. downtown. They're not happy with people at the fourth circle with the office of the prime ministry or near any of the other big development projects, Abdali Boulevard and things. They don't want 
those things disrupted at all. So the space that used to be disruptive no longer is because the city has expanded. The second part, which has to do with the infrastructure, is I find ways in which infrastructural development um, has impeded um, protest spaces. And this was the specific example that my interlocutor said when the spaces are disappearing, is the fourth circle, which didn't used to be a circle. Actually, it was an intersection that was a very clogged intersection in the 90s on a long road that had first, third, second, third circle, et cetera. You're talking about traffic circles. Traffic circles, yeah. So it's illegal to criticize the king under multiple laws. And so people criticize the prime minister instead, because that's a sort of safe spot. So the fourth circle, fourth intersection and traffic circle on Zahran Street uh, is the office of the prime minister is on part of the circle. So that's a place where people protest and they call them fourth circle protests. Um, in the 90s, uh, there were a number of protests uh, for some of them for press freedoms and a number of other issues where they would go out in traffic and basically bring the city to a standstill because this now was a major intersection that circled downtown. It went here, it went in and out. Uh, and they could stop traffic. Traffic was terrible on that road, as anyone who knew Amman in those days were. It was really just very aggravating. So in the 90s, they began building underpasses and overpasses to move them through. So you could still have, uh, after they did this, there was a, a circle, now a circle on top of the fourth circle. But uh, most of the traffic was passing in underpasses and overpasses. So you couldn't bring the city to a standstill anymore. And you're completely not visible to anybody unless they were at the top of the traffic circle. So it really diminished their, you know, their ability to be, um, you know, provocative and contentious. Uh, but they continued protesting on the traffic circle. Um, and then after, I think around 2013, 2014, I mean, all kinds of protests, you know, not one topic. Uh, they fenced off the traffic circle, which was a pedestrian plaza on top with benches. They removed the benches, fenced it off, and put up a bunch of landscaping. So it removed a space where they could gather. They did this also at the, the interior circle where there was a major protest during the uprising period, March 24th uprising. That is now fenced off in landscape. And so there's this is what they were talking about. These spaces where we could gather are disappearing. And this has gone on. There's a fence by the Kaluti Mosque of the main field is all is fenced off now. Uh, a plaza across from parliament, other places around the fourth circle. Then they decided after the 2018 major protests, there were no protests at the fourth circle anymore, um, but people were still, I see announcements for protests at the fourth circle. So I thought they were just going on. So I'm there now uh, at a protest and it has a Facebook page and it's quarter to six and there's armored vehicles at the fourth circle. I'm standing in front of the prime ministry and nobody's there. So I call my friend, I'm like, so what happened? Did you guys cancel it? And they're like, no, we're at the fourth circle. I'm like, no, I'm at the fourth circle. I don't know where you are. And they're like, oh, the fourth circle isn't at the fourth circle anymore. The fourth circle is down the hill at the parking lot by the Jordan Hospital, but they still call it the fourth circle, even though it's not the fourth circle. So then you could protest down there, but that's a parking lot. You're not allowed to get in the, the road and they line up very strongly to prevent you from getting in the road. So you can't be disruptive, but you can still protest there. And there's also an overpass so the, the security services would stand and look down on everything. And then uh, in the pandemic, um, they put up a 10 foot concrete wall around two sides of the parking lot. So you can still get in the parking lot, but there's a 10 foot wall so no one can see anything in there. So this is what they were talking about. And I just, I ended up coming up with the typology just of the different ways in which the sort of uh, infrastructure, public space is you know, uh, altered in ways that make protests less visible, less disruptive, and what have you. And and this is one example of the things when you stop looking at like the labor movement or women's movement or Islamist, and you look at the spaces, you see these changes over this decade that are quite significant and extraordinary. And you could still protest downtown. Like they don't care if you protest up. There's no barricades or anything in that that conventional area. Well, let me ask you about this um concept of protest in in jordan and maybe later on we'll be able to see if there's uh, um i think we were talking over lunch about how you're maybe taking this work uh, in a more comparative uh, direction um but protest in jordan typically we think of protest as something that um damages the state or it highlights a weakness or, or an injustice mm -hmm. perhaps so protests are a 
are a threat to a regime, uh, classically. But you argue all the way through the book um, that protests can act to not only maintain the state, but also to form it, or at least to change its character. And you, you write, for example, that following the Black September conflict in 1970, that King Hussein was able to advance a notion of Jordanization, um, in which Palestinians were rendered as outsiders, um, and Jordanian national identity could be formed around a what you call a mashup of East Bank tribal and, and Bedouins. And I wanted to ask you how you came to this uh, more positive or at least more productive view of protest. Uh, and how it works for Jordan and possibly elsewhere. Yeah, so the the literature on the Jordanization is like a very well established literature where other scholars have detailed that process of, uh, and it in, in, included uh, expanding the welfare state, but for East Bank populations primarily, et cetera, to sort of shore up mm -hmm. support. Um, the positive or productive sides of protests, I think, are twofold, and they're still contentious but they're in surprising ways. So among some, I'm very careful in the book that the, this East Bank Palestinian divide is not a binary. There is so much divide among this East Bank communities, including some of the strongest opposition to the regime, as well as some of the strongest loyalists. So, and so we have to sort of, you know, bracket that, but the regime does have close relations and the military offers predominantly come from portions of these East Bank communities. The Bedouin are in some in the some of the security services that are the harshest, most loyalist security right. services. But they protest. And so a lot of what they're protesting for, and this is what happened in the uprising period. People think Jordan didn't have an uprising. It did have an uprising. It had massive protests. But a portion of those protesters were conservative. Like they want the old state back. They're like, we want the old welfare state. So they were mm -hmm. angry at the regime but they didn't want the downfall of the regime. Others were calling for a democracy, a constitutional monarchy, some various versions. But even amongst the ones that are broadly conservative, I document a range of views from, you just need to change some of the policies. We want the welfare state back. You know, We support you when you give us stuff. To um, the monarchy can stay, but maybe a different monarch. This is where the debate about Hamza comes up. Uh, the monarchy can stay and you can stay, but this is the last monarch. Uh, and in this, you heard a lot of these, this language and the monarchy can stay, but it has to become ceremonial, like a constitutional monarchy for real. Uh, and those are all conservative views, but they were making demands. And so they're, you know, in the, those claims, while they're making claims on the regime, they're not calling for the fall of the regime, just mm -hmm. calling for a regime that's going to do what they want more. Another way in which some protests, I argue, and this is more contentious ones, that they're trying to, um, that are doing work that I think is helping to reinforce the regime. So the conventional look at protests is, did they succeed or fail? Did they get what they're asking? for? So I have a whole chapter on the routine protests at the Kaluti Mosque, which are anti-normalization protests. They're calling for the end of the peace treaty. You know, the Israeli embassy has to evacuate. They have no expectation they're going to accomplish that. Right? That doesn't mean they don't want to accomplish it, but they're out there protesting knowing that's not what they're going to do. So I ask instead, like, what work do these protests do? Like, what are political effects of these protests in all directions? For protesters, they say that they keep some protest space open. Like, we don't want to lose this protest space, and we're afraid if we stop, we're never going to get to protest here again. So we're going to keep protesting, even though we do exactly predictably what the government wants. You know, we're not actually trying to get to the Israeli embassy. Um, it's almost like pretending to march on the Israeli embassy. And also they say that then they want to make sure people know that this is where to go, where there is when protests happen. So when we had the Sheikh Jar um, catastrophe a year and a half ago, everybody knew where to go on that issue. Um, and in other things, the Muslim Brotherhood especially does this, is they show up at protests downtown and at the Kaluti Mosque, and they take tons of pictures and they end up in a Sibyl newspaper about look how, you know, awesome the Islamists are and we're fighting back and demanding the end of the peace treaty, but they disappear. Like they never actually confront the riot. So it's kind of a photo op for them. So that's something else that's happening at those protests. On to your first question though, those protests I argue also help reproduce state power because 
while they're while the protesters are making contentious claims, they're conforming exactly to what the police in the state want them to do. They gather here, they move to the street, they go up to the riot police, who, by the way, the sidewalks are open, so passersby don't have to be inconvenienced by the protests. So they're not really trying to get to the embassy. They're acting as if they're trying to get to the embassy, and they protest for a while, and then they leave after a couple hours. Um, and so I argue by sort of doing what the regime is say, rendering acceptable, a, an acceptable routine, they're then also reproducing state power by not actually challenging the state. So those are ways in which I think protests have these surprising political effects other than just challenging. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and that's throughout your your book. Mm -hmm. And you also, as a geographer, I found it very interesting how you zoom in and out and you have a great sensitivity to, to scale uh, and what you call a, a spatial imaginary. Um, the spatial imaginary is not just a description of how things are, mm -hmm. but of how they could be, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what was it about that that kind of um, you thought was appropriate uh, sort of lens, as it were, to, right. to understand the protests, the spatial imaginary? Yeah, well, there's, you know, really interesting debates in geography on scale and do we need scale and flat ontologies right. and all these things, which I don't get into, but they made me, and Neil Brenner's work made me think about how to think about scale in interesting ways and the sort of the Google Maps thing, like if you zoom in really close, you can see, you know, uh, gum on a sidewalk, but you don't know where you're at. And so you're always, you know, by gaining detail, you know, so the goal with that was to see what was gets brought into view by these different scales. So the spatial imaginaries came to me thinking about, um, you know, as I said, you know, the area that becomes Jordan wasn't understood as a people or a cohesive land to the people living there. But that doesn't mean they didn't see attachments to themselves and to each other. And they had different kinds of attachments. So a lot in the north saw themselves as the southern part of greater Syria, but also had, you know, Ajloon had its own identity. The Beni Sakhar knew what their territory was, and people knew different tribal confederations had different lands. So we un I know this is my land and you know, it's yours, even though we fight over it and we still try to push the boundaries. Uh, in the south, particularly in Ma'an, in the in the Huaytat tribe, there a number of them identify as the northern part of the Hejaz. In fact, Ma'an is dis divided between Ma'an Hejazi and Ma'an uh, um, Shami, um, the north and south. But the people between them didn't necessarily, if you were north of that divide, they didn't, like in uh, Karak and Tefila, didn't think of themselves as greater Syria first. Like in a sense they did, but they kind of didn't. They also understood themselves as having strong local identities. The Karakis have like a long history of rebellion against the Ottoman and have this strong identity of like, we are the ones who are badass and willing to rebel. And they'll still talk about that today. And in their, you know, grandfather's memoirs, they imagine that. And then you have this colonial project trying to bring this entity into being. And so I was trying to find a language that helped me say, you know, I understood myself as this part of this community, but then I'm also part of something bigger, but then I understand that it sort of overlaps in complicated ways. And then as you move through time, this thing of Jordan does come to be an entity that people recognize uh, and start using the language of Jordan for Jordanians, meaning Jordan, not just for not Hejazis, but not for why are you employing all these Syrians and Palestinians in this new state? Why aren't you employing the Transjordanian? You know, they didn't use Transjordanian, but why aren't you employing us? And so you have these different um, understandings come into meaning and carrying into the future, as you're saying. And the ones that, that I, I, I spend really careful attention to the chants people use at protests and what they write on their placards. And one that's very common is um, which is we were Jordanian before the Great Arab Revolt, which means the Hashemites are not Jordanian. It's a really contentious claim. And it, it appears a lot. And invoking that is invoking a spatial imaginary of now we're remembering, remembering the fact that we were this people. You're an outsider. And that means you might not always be here. We're still Jordanians, but it opens up this other kind of future that we're still going to be here as Jordanians, but this might be your last days. And I just, it, it was a helpful term rather than having to decide definitively what belongs to where, to have shifting, people shifting understandings. And they're not gone. I mean, people in Ajloon 
you know, still see themselves closely connect to Dara in what is southern Syria. You know, they have family connected, and so there's those imaginaries are still have, still have real weight to them for yeah. for the people living in the area. And I wanted to capture that complexity rather than the, you know, uh, bunch of people that weren't connected to anything, and now they're Jordanians, and that's the end of the story because it just doesn't accord with what people understand from my research. Of course, I think a part of the um, spatial imaginary is the way that the state also acts to erase. I mean, you talk about this um, quite evocatively um, in the book. Um, and there's a sort of a sense of temporality here, too, perhaps, of erasing. I think you describe you de you describe it as the sort of the slower, dustier mm -hmm. uh, a man uh, in favor of a more high speed sort of um, globally uh, plugged in um metropolitan uh center uh, and then but you go on to couple this i think in an interesting way with the with the observation that these neoliberal spaces um where the state supposedly recedes um is a fiction um a fiction though that can only work because of these erasures mm -hmm. right so i was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this erasure um uh, and ways of, of seeing uh, and therefore ordering these spaces. Great, yeah, so there's a lot there. So, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 not at all. Um, particularly after the Jordanization period after Black September, when the, the regime invests in this narrative uh, heavily, this East Bank narrative and the, you know, the black and white kafia become foreign, even though we have Palestinians, becomes foreign and the red and white, um, becomes the Jordanian symbol. There's this uh, investment in this continues, especially in the last 20 years, in the narrative of like this great, you know, Bedouin tribal past that we finally defeated the empire and we're moving into the future. And this is represented in uh, the uh, King Hussein Gardens has these dioramas of like our past moving into a future. The Royal Automobile Club, you know, it's all in from this like dusty, noble past on horseback uh, to this high speed, zippy future. Um, and that requires erasing everything that doesn't fit into that narrative. So you have now these parodies like the, the great, the commemorations of the um, Great Arab Revolt or um, on Army Day, these sort of mashup of different tribal you know, heritage and songs and background that aren't of one thing, but making in Munsef is a national system, you know, making everything into this single homogenized past and these skyscrapery futures um, misses the modern period, which is the middle of the 20th century when there's a lot of resistance and revolt and architectures, architects and urban planners in Amman have been fighting, failing for decades to preserve that sort of 30s, 40s, 50s architecture that's distinctly Jordanian, but it's treated as not like desirable. And so that gets destroyed one after another. And I document a bunch of them. So you have, you can better have this gleaming future juxtaposed to this romantic past. The problem is for Amman as a city is it doesn't have an oriental romantic past, right? It's a brand new city as we've talked about. Uh, and so there exist several projects. One was funded by Japan. It, didn't get completed, but to kind of reorientalize the downtown area, right? So you get rid of all the little, you know, low end coffee shops to have like more cute coffee shops. And you get in the, the low end Argila stores to have like fancy Argila stores, you know, so it has a kind of orientalist past, but there's, there's an actual his, mid century history there that's, you know, it's just not marketable and doesn't fit into this past to the gleaming future moment. And so that's getting destroyed, despite all, you know, all kinds of efforts of, you know, architects to try to preserve these buildings. Yeah. Um, but it's a narrative in the service of preserving the regime and insisting on the regime, the Hashimaji regime's centrality to Jordan's future, because it was central to its, its past. And in protest, you're mm -hmm. seeing all kinds of poking holes in that fiction. They're like, we're not buying it, you know maps they'll bring out at protests that'll have like um all the tribes that were there in 1917 and who they who was where and what their domains were their spatial imaginaries mm. you know and monster maps they'll have a display at protests which is like you weren't here you know hashi bikes weren't here mm -hmm. so it's really fascinating to me that yeah. aspect of yeah. it yeah and, and you mentioned i think somewhere 
um, that you've developed this typology of, um, I guess, political strategies for, for managing the, the protests. We've mentioned erasure, but you also mentioned a kind of um, observation um, strategy as well. So this is ability of the state to sort of mix and match. I think mean, you have five five Wait, different enclosures, uh, enclosures. Yeah, and you, you write about this in a chapter on the militarization of space, which is uh, certainly one of the um, more interesting chapters for me as a as a geographer. But I wanted to ask one more one more. We've got time for a couple more quick questions, perhaps. Um, I'll try and combine them, perhaps. Um, uh, one of the things you're very keen about in, in the book is to um, sort of mention the routinization of the protests. Um, but I, I don't want to let you get away without asking <laughs> about counter protests, mm -hmm. um, perhaps by loyalists um, who are staging you know, sort of either their own counter protests or they're actually trying to do something to to make the protest more violent, even though it sets out as being purposefully um, peaceful. There, that you have a photo of them in in here. Perhaps if I hold this up, you can see. But they're dressed in plain clothes. Uh, this is a picture yeah. you took, yes. right? They're, they're dressed in plain clothes. Um, uh, you call them Balta Gia, yes. is that right? Um, and they have sticks and batons sometimes as well. Very often. They, here they don't. This yeah. stick uh, turned up at a protest and they were clearly coordinating with the Dara, the, the, the gendarmerie riot police. Uh, and they lined up, and so you had the, the riot police in their riot gear and they lined up with their backs to the riot police holding hands and then the protest was here. And there's tons of photographers around and this ends up being, I mean, it does two things. It's a tactic that if there's any violence, they can plausibly say it's not state actors. Um, and two, these guys are willing to use violence and very happy to push aggressively and knock people over and things like this. Uh, it was a number of these guys in the March 24th youth protest that was an encampment during the uprising in 2011 that came in from a counter protester, counter protest and came in by the hundreds and the, the YouTube um, videos that you can see, there's very clear coordination with mm. military mm. uniformed um, uh, police. Uh, where to go and what to do. So they're clearly coordinating. Whether they were coordinated and brought in by the government, sometimes yes, because you can see they come in on government vehicles. Sometimes they just show up and we don't know if they've just come up on their own. You know, we have this in the United States with like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters, they're sort of, that went to Portland on their own to protect the police and beat the Black Lives Matter protesters. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But for me, how coordinated it is at the state isn't something that I can really know, but the effects of it are really clearly present. And in this particular picture, I mean, at, at this protest, and um, uh, I have a number of pictures in the chapter, I'm walking in and around the protest and it's mm -hmm. there's riot police there. And normally in a non-democratic country, you don't really go six feet from riot police and take their picture, but nobody cares because it's just one of these routine protests. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it really doesn't matter. When these guys come in, there's a, there's a picture here. You can't really see it. This guy is really glaring at me. He's very, he's just giving me this like very threatening look. And is the only threatening look I got that entire day. And the regular police didn't care that I was there and taking pictures because everyone was. But these guys were, you know, they're looking for a fight. They're looking to prove mm -hmm. the loyalists. They're looking for people to beat up. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. That's it. That's and then that's they, they do call them now Beltagia. At the time when these guys, this was 2009, was one of the first protests where they showed up. The activists didn't have, weren't using that term yet. Okay. And it, it became, it's used in Egypt. I don't know when it started use in Egypt. Um, but then they adopted that term to describe them as, yeah. as a thing. But before they didn't have that term, or at least it wasn't widespread used among activists that they were there. But the technique is definitely there. Yeah, it's interesting that you felt safe to. Walk totally. around until you came to, Till those to guys. the counter protesters. Yeah. Um, well, maybe at this point we can um, take take it to the audience. Would that be about uh, what we want to do now? Well, if you want to ask one more question, I think we have time, and then we can turn it to the audience. Oh, okay. Um, one more, I think. Well, if I get one more, I, yeah. I wanted to I wanted to come back to this this um, this. Professionally, a geography question. Great. Um, to this 
typology that you um, develop um, later on in the book. I think it's the next to last chapter. Yeah, chapter eight. Yeah. Um, so you you have a chapter on the militarization of of space, um, and then you go through this sequence, and and I'll just read them out. You've got exposure, which I understand as being the state seeing things, you know, mm -hmm. people being exposed, as it were. But then this erasure as well, which is an interesting juxtaposition because the state is doing two different things there, right? It's both sort of seeing, but then putting away, erasing mm -hmm. other things that it doesn't want to see, right? And then um, more physically, you've got enclosures. Mm -hmm. So I think here of protests in Britain um, where they use a tactic known as kettling. Yes. Have you ever come across it's that? It's here too. Yeah, okay. Um, so that means sort of trapping people off to the side of a protest uh, for a little while. Um, exclusions of various kinds. These are all E words. Uh, I, know, I couldn't get the last one. And then one. the last one is containment. <laughs> um, so you, you talk yeah. about the state sort of deploying any in, in uh, and all of these in, in perhaps different uh, combinations. And we talked a little bit about erasure, um, but I think what's interesting to me um, is how, you know, the state may be doing sort of two things at once. I think it gets back maybe to the question about the the um, sort of the temporal, temporality as well. So there's a sort of a, a seeing, but only a seeing of what it wants to see, right, the, the state doing this is sort of looking, but also covering up mm -hmm. uh, uh, simultaneously. But that's quite a sophisticated uh, set of practices, isn't it? And I wonder if in your uh, sort of comparative work that you've alluded to, you, you might be thinking of taking that forwards uh, in any way or seeing yeah. if it works elsewhere? Yeah, that's precisely what I'm working on this uh -huh. semester as the, the CUNY uh, ARC fellow. Okay. Um, is to think comparatively about those um, practices. Um, and so I've been collecting, and I would love to collect from you all as well, the thoughts of like the sort of this made me think of. So just to give some examples, um, the erasures include things very obviously like the Pearl Roundabout, right? We have to not only get rid of the statue of the Pearl Roundabout, the roundabout becomes a, per a perpendicular intersection. It gets renamed entirely. And a coin with the statue on it has to be taken out of circulation because we have to get rid of this symbol at all costs. Um, in Cairo, uh, you know, uh, getting rid of all the graffiti, uh, the graffiti, the art, the beautiful art, the, anything that reminds you of the revolution. So these erasures are efforts to eliminate anything that indicated it was a place of protest or rebellion and often then replace it with like military statues or statues to the police or nationalist symbols and flags and these kinds of things. Um, the exposures, the you know the classic example is the is Paris in uh, mm -hmm. the Osman reconstruction. Um, the 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 incidents we have in Jordan of this is uh, Sumaya Street in Wehdat camp, and Sumaya Street is a very wide street. If you've seen the movie Hurt Locker, it's where the opening scene to Hurt Locker is filmed, and that was not a wide street during Black September. It was widened afterwards because the government discovered that it couldn't get into the because of the shape of the city and the winding hills and because of the refugee camps were, had such narrow streets, they couldn't get into them. And so they cut these wide swaths into certain parts of the city to create places that they could move through. Um, the exclusions, I talked about the fences, you know, just made, rendering spaces inaccessible for protesters. Containment, I tried to come up with something with an <laughs> E. I couldn't come up with it, but these are things like uh, campuses and you know Jordan University is a classic campus with huge high walls and chokehold entrances and so you can protest all you want just don't try to leave and they won't let you leave similarly in some of the camps Baha camp has a lot of protests they don't interfere with the protests they just won't let the protests leave you know cross under the highway and try to block anything and so you know I'm looking at this sort of range of techniques and um, I'm collecting, I have already have great examples from Cairo, Beirut and Istanbul. Um, I'm, I've been suggested uh, Guatemala City had some protests over mm -hmm. the summer that that where the policing in the public square was very different than policing in side areas, even though it was exact same topic. So I'm trying to collect some examples of this and think more broadly and comparatively about this in you know, extended. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, that's what this project is hoping okay. to do.
Right. So I'm happy to hear that you found that intriguing. Intriguing, and uh, I was Absolutely. going to ask yeah. you what you thought were the, you know, some of the more um, interesting uh, efforts that I make because, of course, I'm not a geographer. Right, right. And you know, I'm. I feel I'm more borrowing from geography insights to make sense in political science debates. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't remain a geographer. I mean, borrow what you like, but uh, yeah, but need was, to remain but, within boundaries. Yeah. But I was just interested in, in the parts that you found particularly. But I think that's been quite interesting because you know, classically, um, uh, you know, going all the way back to urbanists like Kevin Lynch and his book, The Image of the City, um, where he offers a sim similarly a five ways of reading the city. Uh, and some of it is similar to yours. It's um, things like, you know, nodes or landmarks or uh, active pathways and edges um, or areas that contain things. But in but in none of that does he have the sort of more political inflection, the more um, strategies of power that I think you, you talk about that are more active. Mm -hmm. I mean, his are sort of pre-existing spaces. There's nothing there to explain how an edge is formed or how an edge is, is maintained. You know, because mm -hmm. to, in order to have something, you have to get rid of something else. And I think that this kind of, this typology um, speaks to that uh, in a very illuminating way, how, for me anyway, how power, how power works. In order to see, you also have to not see, mm -hmm. right? So it's this, this sort of paradox almost that is, is, is incredibly, um, Incredibly suggestive. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, w w one thing to add on on these techniques mm -hmm. um, that I mentioned the book, but only briefly. But I don't know. People often ask me, uh, "What is the state thinking, or what, what? You know, how did they come up with this plan?" Like, I don't know how the thinking is happening from the top. And so there was a um, after the Sheikh Jarrah protests, there was a. Um, a there's an anthropologist who I'm on his committee and he's there working on graffiti and he was telling me that they uh, painted Israeli flags on all the trash cans. People were. So mm. It's trash. Mm. And the, someone in the municipality went through and had them all taken off. But he did that of his own, you know, initiative, thinking that the government would, you know, the regime would like him if he did that. So all of these fencing and, and walls, I don't know from where those directives are coming. I'm guessing that once one or two went up, then they're trying to just shut down every protest spaces because we know that's what we're supposed to do now. But I think it's an interesting question of how much it's, you know, directed on top. It doesn't change the political effects of it, but I find it interesting that the parts of the regime might be learning from each other from these tech techniques and going, oh, well, they did mm -hmm. it there, mm -hmm. so maybe we'll do this here now. The the field at the Kaluti Mosque is a private property and it has a an mm. eight foot chain link fence around it and a sign that says for rent like why you would rent a rocky field i don't know mm. but um but what, what was i was unable to find out who the owner was to find out if he was told to put that up or he decided to put it up because he just didn't want the protester on his protest on his land or what i have no idea yeah, yeah. but you can still for protests see the political effects of it and yeah. so it's something I'm hoping I could get more traction on. But that is this is the piece that I'm trying to do as a broader comparative piece. So right. um, yeah. I'll I'll ask you for some um, readings that like that you've mentioned that I might think about as well. But if um, anybody has cases you know of that they make yeah, me think of something, I really yeah. welcome just hearing about them because I can follow up on that. So thank you. Open <laughs> question. Yes, please. <laughs> First, let me say I am Jordanian. I haven't lived there in the past 40 years, but that's half my life. Um, the line of research is very interesting, but it's new too. So the way I would analyze protests, in no major protests, violent protests, mm -hmm. 1916, the Great Arab Revolt, 48 War, formation of Jordan with the West Bank, uh, 1958, the Baghdad Pact. Things got so bad, my parents took me after school and sent me to Lebanon. And uh, 1970. Mm -hmm. And the variables I would use to analyze those are 
and socioeconomic, international relations, ethnicity, that kind of thing. So now you're doing much smaller, more peaceful type of protests primarily, but you also talk about 1970. So how do you fit 1970 into this framework? Great. So I'm not only speaking about small protests, and I actually talk extensively about all the ones that you've looked at. The Baghdad Pact is a fascinating period because it effectively pressured the government to not join the Baghdad Pact. So it was a successful protest in a conventional standard. Um, so it's not that I'm not looking at the big ones, but the big ones have the bulk of the research and study on them. And people don't notice there's a whole, all these other, you know, modes of protest happening over time. I think the big ones are moments that shape what else is possible afterwards. So like after the Black September, which a lot of people will object and say that's not a protest, but you know, by my count of like, you can't not put that in the framework of, you know, fighting with the regime for something, right? Um, that had the after effects that affected protests for, you know, 20 years, there were not a lot of protests because there was severe torture and arrest of people and cracking down on the leftists and the Nakabat building and all of, all of that. Um, so I'm trying to say like this wide culture of protest needs to be put in the context of these big moments that you mentioned. And then look at this long array, 150 years, and see what patterns come into view. It's not to say that my approach is more right or correct than other approaches, like looking at the big events, which, as you rightly say, were profoundly important for the state and the socioeconomic issues were central, but that we can see other things politically by adding these smaller protests into a richer picture of protests. That's why my definition of protest is so broad. So I can have the Great Arab Revolt and, uh, you know, revolts against, you know, the Bedouin tearing up the railroad and sit-ins and Black September and all of these things that a lot of political science would say, you can't put those in the same, you know, and I'm saying they're not the same. But if we think of the sort of contours of, of acts of resistance over a longer period of time, we find one that Jordanians have no shyness about speaking up you know, and have consistently. They're not just these big moments. There's like a consistent, you know, talking back to the regime through protests that's pretty much doesn't stop. And that's kind of the, that's why I call it protesting Jordan. It's a state that's, there's, there's a lot of resistance constantly. And it's unusual for a democratic state because most of the protests don't end violently, but people do, even in the last 30 years, there's dozens of deaths at protests. They're just not in a single massacre. It's a couple people here, one there, two or three there. Um, so it's just trying to enrich the picture rather than to say that those were not worthy of study. But when you deal with 1970, mm -hmm. do you revert to talking about socioeconomics? I'm really interested in nationalism. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's in there, but it's the, the object of the, the study is about the trajectories of protest. So I really, it's, it's not disagreeing with that. It's just not the focus of the study. And there are books written about Black September, the people who've done original research and all the oral histories and stuff. And I'm borrowing on their literature. I haven't done anything new on Black September, except to draw out the way it shaped, you know, the way the government cut these roads into parts of the city so that they could access them. That hasn't really been highlighted in any of the studies I've seen. So that's the piece I'm hoping to add. So, but thank you so much for coming and for sharing your comments. Yeah. Can I ask that? Sure. Yeah. Do, it. yeah. Can do research. Well, how did you go about collecting your facts? So I, said, I worked as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And you were speaking about the University of Jordan, protests at the University of Jordan. Yeah. We'd be contacted by the Minister of Information, who would say, don't write anything about protest at the University of Georgia. Right. So if you went back to newspapers as a source of information, you might not find it. I know. That's why you have to do all the oral histories. And there are a lot of people at the University of Jordan, also at the Yarmouk University protests in the 80s that are still alive. And I have a lot of like oral histories from people that were there from the 60s um, through the 70s and 80s. Um, we're going to okay. take some more questions. Okay. But thank you so much for joining us. No. Yes. I, have, I have a massive question. <laughs> uh, one I really appreciate is 
approach to looking at protests beyond the repressive resistance model and looking at the productiveness of them. I also really appreciate your examination of them as site means forms of political activity, not municipal to the particular movement they're part of. So with that, are there then parallels with state pageants, marches, and events? One question. Mm -hmm. we'll see how the others <laughs> yeah, I do touch um I do talk about those in the sense of like the commemorations of the Great Arab Revolt. Um Queen Rania loves to lead marches. So whenever there's something contentious, they try to sort of like hijack the energy. So around uh Palestine issues, very often the second intifada, right? She leads this, you know, the protests are against Israel for, you know, doing what it's doing, against the United States and against the Jordanian government for having this peace treaty. So she launches, and there's a spatial issue um, from the fifth circle, which is symbolic of nothing except expensive hotels, um, to a UN humanitarian office in Shmesani. And, and they have this campaign to please text this number and donate 10 JDs for humanitarianism. So they're trying to shift it from governments are to blame for this to you can help Palestinians. You know, so there's tons of like, not tons, but there are a number of uh, marches um and those kind of counter things where they're trying to redirect the energy and particularly and of course the you know the pageantry of military parades um and there's great parallels i should have mentioned i, I found great parallels and i have to, to read more on these but um in the soviet era the sort of construction of those massive squares which are intended to mm -hmm. be military parades or places for massive people to gather and say how much they love the regime mm -hmm. then become places for protest like massive gatherings of protest which wasn't what they were intended and so now you have cities, um, I mean, I'm told this was the case with Jeddah, I have to look into it, but the gnome planning supposedly is not going to have urban squares because they don't want it to be there. In, uh, uh, this is in the book also, in the, the Abdali Boulevard, which is this huge mega project in downtown Amman, um, on the southernmost end of it, um, there where Abdali Mall is underground, was supposed to have a plaza. And they didn't build the plaza because they were worried people would use it for protests. So it exists on all the plans and it never got built because they're like, we don't want people to protest. So I'm interested in those kinds of like actual concrete thinking, like, mm -hmm. oh, how do we construct an urban area where we don't want people to protest? So. Did I miss part of your question? Or, yeah. Oh, no, no, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So I love the Jordan for eight years. I was wondering, so I was, I was aware of the influx of immigration in the 2010. I was wondering, does it have any effect on the protests and how does that affect that housing? So the only example I have of it has to do with the Syrian refugees, which isn't, people aren't protesting the Syrians being there. They're protesting that the Syrians, okay, a majority, only a minority of Syrians are in camps, in refugee camps. Most of them are in and around the urban sectors. But there's a lot of resentment, particularly in the north, that the camps have adequate water and they don't. And so there's a lot of protests in the north about, you know, we get water once a week and now we haven't water, had water for three weeks. And there was one where uh, the king went up personally and he's like, we have tankers of water on our way now. And they're like, we don't want tankers of water. We want a water main. And they block the road. They block the road to Iraq, the highway road. And they're like burning tires. They're like, and this was one where someone died in one of these clashes. So they're not entirely uncontentious. And they have running water. It's not always flowing, but so that's in this resentment about, you know, how can you work this out for the refugees where they're getting these things? And how can you work it out for every new hotel and mega project that has endless water, endless resort? And we don't have water. Like, what are you doing? And there's so they'll, they're ang they'll they'll organize around those issues. There might be protests against the refugees per se, but I haven't documented any, or I haven't been told of any. But there may well be that I just missed. It's stunning to me every time I talk to people how many more protests I learn about that I hadn't like known about, which only tells me I can't imagine what I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thanks for being here. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, no, thank you. I have a lot of questions. One of them, um, I was kind of hoping that maybe you could draw some connections to some of your other work, especially like your work revolving policing. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned a little bit about policing and arrests and kind of engaging, dealing with different kinds of security and uh, protesters and things like that. 
But I was hoping if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, the role of kind of the security apparatus, broadly speaking, in the story that you're talking about, Jordan, with laws. That's, that's a big question. It's a great question. It does come in in the story, you know, because the, the beginning of it, in, you know, in the 20s is a story of, you know, partly the, the first military or armed forces is taking the Bedouin instead of the Bedouin having all these raids, like, we'll employ you. And so that existed up until today, those, that history and connections. Um, the number of uh, security forces explode after Black September. The GID was created in that moment and is huge. Um, my, my trip to Jordan this summer, I mean, everybody's telling me that the GID, the Muhabarat, those intelligence services, are running everything now like everything. So the king wants there to be three political parties, a right party, a center party, and a left party. And so they're coercing the existing parties to try to conform to this. And it's the GID that's doing it. So there's like real, this real strangeness. They seem to have sort of dominated. Um, whereas a decade ago, I mean, they were always really problematic, but a decade ago, people complained a lot about the Kuwait al Darek, the gendarmerie, which was relatively, I think it was created in 2008, they complained that they were the more aggressive, difficult policing agency. And now there's less complaint about them and there's more, there's complaint about them. But there's so much complaint about the GIDs everywhere and doing everything. Um, and I, you know, this isn't just from activists, this is from like former government officials. Um, so, that, you know, that are a lot feeling it's really gone way too far. Um, but uh, that's a very thin answer to your question. And I think, you know, like people like Pete Moore have written more explicitly on security and military. It's just not my area of expertise. Yeah. So I have kind of a multifaceted question. You I was really interested when you started talking about, you know, what, which protests, like, does the government care about? Mm -hmm. And which ones do they not care about? And so, like, trying to figure out those red lines. Um, both spatially, so where, again, where are you allowed to protest right. and where you're not allowed to protest, but also politically, um, how how do you think that those are playing out, right, from, you talked a little bit about how you're not sure in terms of the layers of, right. um, but also how do people navigate that, so the people who are protesting, you know, um, do they, like, test <laughs> like, right. like send a test protest and see, oh, that space is, you know, okay. Oh, you know, how is this being negotiated, I guess? Because I feel like, yeah, as you've described it, it's an authoritarian context that is not um, necessarily cracking down in the ways that we've seen other authoritarian right, right. regimes. So I'm just interested in that tension. Yeah, I mean, it's a really, it's a important piece of the book. There's, and I draw in David Graeber's work about the sort of negotiating of rules that the state has disproportionate power, obviously. And so the resources available to protesters are largely symbolic and moral claims making, et cetera. Um, and protesters are trying to, you know, often trying to push the boundaries or test when they can push the boundaries. Uh, and the government's always pushing back in the, the, the Baltagia one. This was a very routine protest where these guys suddenly showed up and protesters are like, but we're we're doing the routine. And so there's a spatial routine for certain locations. Like downtown, you meet at the Grand Husseini Mosque, you march to the municipal center, you have a bunch of speeches, and then you go home. So it has a spatial and a temporal regime. As long as you adhere to that, you're mostly fine. At the Kaludi Mosque, you meet, you gather, you pretend to march on the embassy, you sing Mautani, and you go home. And that's, you know, there, as long as you do that, you're mostly okay. But it's not always the case. So there's always that kind of tension. You're not sure. There was a protest um, around the Abraham Accords that met at, uh, it's a, a march on the U.S. Embassy. It met, met at the Taj Mall Circle, marched a few blocks, protested, stopped well short of the U.S. Embassy and went home. And several of the um, leaders of the protest were arrested the next day. And they're like, why? We did like, we did what was okay. Why is this suddenly not okay? So there's there is that neg negotiation about what you can and cannot do, um, and there are innovations like the the interior circle was never a place of protest until the March 24 youth claimed it, and then it became a super super contentious place, and then they put up the fence to make nobody protest there. So you know there is innovation, you know, in those sort of pushing the boundaries and 
uh, that I'm trying to look at. But I, I'm specifically in the city, there's certain spatial routines, like the Kaluti Mosque has a spatial routine. The parliament is just stand there up opposite of the parliament. There's sometimes marches that end at the parliament, but you pretty much just stand there. But the only temporal regime that the government likes is like, you know, two to five hours. You know, you gotta go, no encampments, no tents. And tents used to be okay. And then after the uprising period in the March 24th youth, tents were threatening suddenly. And now they go, I have a chapter yeah. on the, where I talk about, David Graeber has this famous piece called Fear of Giant Puppets <laughs> about how the police and, at uh, social justice rallies, they'd have these giant puppets to try to sort of make them playful. And they would say they would have to destroy these puppets because there were going to be bombs in them. But the police are tearing the puppets apart. So they don't really think there's bombs in them, but they're just determined there's going to be no puppets. And so now I think it's tents in Jordan. They do not want tents. They can do what you want. And so you'll find like in Diban or other small towns, they'll put up a tent because somebody's imprisoned or something and they'll just sit out there, just sit on chairs under the tent and they'll come a hundred direct police to tear the tents down. There was a anti-gas deal protest. They had this massive banner they were trying to unfurl and I have a picture of it. And they fought with the, the police for hours to convince them it wasn't a tent, it's just a banner. And they put it, the plot opposite of the Ministry of, um, of uh, Energy so that they would have to look down and see uh, the gas of the enemy is occupation was their slogan. And so they would have to look at it, but they had to fight because they thought it was gonna be a tent. So I'm like those kinds of, you know, I'm interested in these shifting routines, like what is okay now doesn't, isn't necessarily gonna be okay. And that's one of the reasons the protesters in that chapter, yeah, here's this massive banner. It's like huge. Um, uh, I forgot my, my train of thought, but yeah, so it's, it's um, the routines are shifting, you know, and the government really doesn't, the government doesn't want protest, I think. I think there's enough evidence. They really don't like people protesting, but they are so, eager to be where the moderate state, and Washington loves Jordan as the moderate state, right? And if Jordan's moderate because it doesn't kill a dissident with the bone saw, or it doesn't fire live ammo into a crowd and massacre people, you know, congratulations. I'm supposed to congratulate Jordan for not <laughs> being, off. I know, right? <laughs> so I'm not having it. I'm very, you know, and I watched a lot of people's lives be destroyed by, by the GID, by the government and family, whole families and people thrown out of uh, university because someone in their family won't stop protesting and all these things that are happening. So, um, but I think the when we talk about the political work of protest, by not being monstrous at protests allows Jordan to perform how awesome it is. In fact, this cover, which is actually has the full picture in this chapter somewhere. Um, was by Nidal Khairi, who's a Palestinian act, Jordanian, a Palestinian descent activist. And this picture here, this is the gendarmerie, and this little boy's hugging him. And this is a little military officer. This was in the uh, May of 2018 anti austerity, anti tax reform protests at the Fourth Circle. And this says here, so Kuwait al-Darak, the Darak forces, it says cute Darak, meaning the Darak is cute, they're really well behaved, he's getting the love, there's a little heart at the fourth circle. And over here, they're bashing heads, and this is in Hayatafela, which is not far away. Same slogans, down with the World Bank, but in this area, completely fine on the fourth circle. In this neighborhood, they cordoned it off and beat people. And so it's like, why? why these kids over here are getting bashed their heads in. And here, the crown prince uh, showed up to thank the officers for protecting Jordanians' right to peacefully demonstrate. This huge show. So I think the government uses certain things like that to show how moderate it is, to perform for international audience, how progressive and different it is when it's still doing horrible things. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Jillian and Jeremy, for joining us. Thank you, thank you so much. much. Thank you.